Good morning, saints. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's a sort of a mixed feelings for Terry and I as this is our last Sunday, and then we won't see you all for about five and a half months, uh, but we do have to serve our time in Canada. <laughs> and it's a real delight. I'm so honored that uh, we have some of our neighbors here with us. We really have three families. We have our family back in Canada. We have our Life Church family, and you are very much family to us. But our neighborhood is the best neighborhood in all of Glendale. I'm telling you, we have the best neighbors, and they are really family to us. And so it's great to see you here with us this morning. So we're very honored to have you. Um, I asked Dave Martinez to lead in that last song, Beautiful. And I know it's speaking about our Lord Jesus Christ, but... In a roundabout way, too, I want you to think of some of those words when it, as it pertains to Scripture. Uh, God has given us this tremendous gift called the Bible, and uh, it never ceases to amaze me. I can't believe that, that to all those years ago, I got tapped on the shoulder, and I was given permission to study Scripture, to teach Scripture, and to continue to minister in, in Scripture. And so it's a, a delight for me to do this today. Well, Derek has started this series, Proverbs, Life as it is meant to be lived. And uh, some of you know that for several years I've been teaching a midweek Bible study called Unpacking the Proverbs. And of course, there's that beautiful, beautifully designed uh, title page that we use. I've been asked a few times from some of you, very respectfully, how I feel about uh, Derek having the chutzpah to cut my grass by doing a sermon series on Proverbs. <laughs> so allow me to be honest and speak out of that green zone. I was initially quite concerned, actually, when he said that he was going to be doing a series. So that's my honesty. Especially when I was told what he originally planned to call the sermon series, and he was going to call it Proverbs the way it was meant to be taught. <laughs> now, it doesn't take very much to unpack that dig against what I've been doing with Life Church for all, all these uh, seasons of teaching Proverbs. I'm, I've been doing it for several years. We're finally into Proverbs chapter 16, so it's taken a long time. But here's, you know, Pastor Derek, and he's going to cover the whole book in, what, six or eight weeks? Anyways, fortunately, the board got a wind of this title, and they knew that it was going to be quite inappropriate. You think Derek would have had the wisdom for that. And so he came up with an alternate title, and it was Proverbs the way Derek thinks it should be taught. <laughs> Again, the board is wiser than most people, and so they corporately came to the decision that that would not be the title, and so we, we've got the present one that's being used. All right. Um, I don't know, do many of you go to the LifeBook uh, Facebook page? Um, I, it's, it's actually very good. There's some really good stuff on there, so you know, check it out. There's good inspirational sayings sometimes, and now lately there have been numbers of Proverbs each day for you to, to kind of think about. So check that out sometime. But there's also some fun stuff on there. And this was up, it's been up for a couple of weeks, I think. No, this, isn't that a great picture? <laughs> but what I like was they came up with several uh, captions to try to explain the look on Pastor Derek's face. And uh, I like this one, when you forget to tell Deb she's in the sermon. And we all know that he includes her as a sermon illustration often, as well as his children. And then I like this one a lot. That's Pastor Derek's look, 30 seconds into Brian Glubish's sermon. So if we had a camera here right now, you could see it. It's almost just like that. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. All right, and some of you have asked me, how do you manage possibly to absorb all the zingers that Pastor Derek sends my way uh, so frequently every Sunday? And it's not just on Sunday, by the way. I just have to, have to let you know that I lean very heavily on, on some of the wisdom of Proverbs. For example, in Proverbs 19.11, it says, A man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to overlook an offense. And uh, so that's given me the strength to carry on day by day and to hang in here at Life Church. Well, seriously, I am very grateful for our friendship commander. And uh, I'm really amazed, Terry, as to at all the people that God has brought into our lives over these last few years as we've... Uh, settled a little bit, at least uh, snowboarding in Phoenix. What a great church we have, what a great number of people we've met, and friends that we've met too. Who knew that Life Church would become this family for us? When I was a New Testament professor up in Canada for 19 years, I would on occasion have students come to me and, uh, after a service, and I could always feel them kind of looking at me during the sermons. 
Because they were always wondering, what does the New Testament professor think about what the preacher is doing with the scripture that he's preaching from? No one at Life Church is asking me about how Derek is treating the book of Proverbs. I'm not sure why. But if asked, asked, I would say this, in all honesty, Derek's sermons have increased my love for the book of Proverbs. So it's been very well done. You've been hitting the ball out of the park, and uh, I really appreciate that. So anyways, i got to tell you this. This is true, too. I was invited to speak for May 6th today, uh, at least two months ago, I think it was, right? And I was given the choice to tackle any issue of Proverbs that I wanted, which is good. And he sent, he gave me kind of a memo of, of what he was covering, and then I could, you know, anything that I felt could, could be addressed, I would address. What he didn't realize is the copy of the memo he gave me had something, a special word to Shannon on it, and I wasn't supposed to see that word to Shannon because she's speaking next week. And what he said there, um, her assignment is to clean up the pieces that Gloovish leaves behind. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? Put up your hand, Pastor. That is a true story. Okay, you, you think I make this stuff up. All right, enough fun. I want to address uh, a very difficult section of Proverbs, one that many have been troubled over, and uh, so I'm going to dismiss the women. Uh, just kidding, sorry. But it's, been, it's, a, it's a difficult passage. Some have been downright discouraged over it. So they felt uh, just a heavy load because of it. And I want to address the issue of the, oh, the Proverbs 31 woman. Now, my aim is not to re- just to rescue the passage from some heavy-handed misunderstanding and preaching, but I want to bring new delight to every one of you. So if you've ever had any difficulty with what's being said in chapter 31, I hope and trust and be- have been praying that God would help us have new delight for it. A few years ago, I was invited to teach Proverbs to a group of lawyers, businessmen, uh, entrepreneurs, shakers and movers indeed, uh, just in Phoenix here. And at my first session on this Tuesday morning, and we were up in a law law building, and we were in this big conference room, beautifully decorated, and in struts this jewelry store owner, and he was wearing a three-piece suit, you know, the vest and the tie and the appropriate bling, and uh, he's quite a character. And as I met... Al, as he swaggered in, and then he said this with such endearing bombast. He says, I just want to know one thing. Who is this Proverbs 31 woman? Because I want to marry her. (laughs) Well, without skipping a beat, I obviously, under inspiration, said, it's too late, Al. I already married her. (laughs) I figured I'd get that response. Well, of course, I'm a bit of a romantic And since it's coming up on Mother's Day and then our anniversary follows shortly after that, I'll be giving Terry Bob her her usual favorite flower. And of course, a good husband should know what his wife's favorite flower is, correct? And so certainly Terry does deserve (laughs) a gold medal. I didn't run that one by her. All right. Okay. Chapter 31. I've entitled this, uh, To Dream the Impossible Dream. Are we? I'm not getting the next slide up here. Where's my man? All right. Anyways, if you have your Bibles or your smartphones or your not-so-smart phones, check out chapter 31. We'll get to there, and then I'm going to go through it verse by verse with you really quickly. All right, chapter 31. And the... it's. It's uh, variously titled the Proverbs 31 woman or the ideal woman, and it starts at verse 10. And so as I go through this text, I want you to keep track, all you wives, all you women, I want you to keep track as I read each verse and say, check, that's me, check, that's me, okay? And husbands, if you're beside your wife, I want you to do the same. And then at the end of chapter, I read that section, I want you to see if your tally matches with your wife. Okay? Now, speaking of love languages, you might want to fudge the data a bit there, husbands. Okay? Good. All right. And if you get all 22 check marks for each of the verses, then I've got a special sticker, a get your face in in the book sticker from Shannon that she'll donate. Okay. All right. We still don't have the text there? One minute? All right. 
Well, I'm, I'm going to start into it, and as soon as it comes up, that's fine. So follow along with me here. A noble wife, or a wife of noble character, who can find? I love the way it starts with that question, right? A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. Gentlemen, did you hear that? She brings you good, not harm, all the days of your life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She's like the merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still dark and prepares food for her family and portions for her servant girls. She considers a field and buys it, and out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously, and her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable. How many of you have portfolios, women? She sees that her trading is profitable, and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff. She grasps the spindle with her fingers. And then I love this part, verse 20, because it says, she opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in plaid, scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the reward she has earned and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. Now, how many women in here, don't put up your hands, but how many women, just kind of, you know, think about it, don't like some of the things that are in that passage? All right? It's just too demanding. Now, in, this is in all seriousness, too. In advanced prep for this sermon, I asked for honest feedback from a number, number of different women in different settings on how they felt about the chapter. Now, it's very tricky for someone to be honest when they're asked a question about how they feel about Scripture. They don't want to say anything negative about how God's Word makes them feel. But I found that the responses were of three varieties. First of all, some said, I don't really think much about it, or I just ignore it. Okay? Number two, uh, a number of them said, I don't mind it, and I sort of wanted to call them liars. Just teasing. But then there's the third category, and I found this one was the, probably the most frequent one. It was the response, I hate it. I hate it. And in fact, our own Shannon Hoffpower, she gave me permission, and she's preaching next week, to say that she's in the I hate the Proverbs 31 woman camp. All right? She also added, by way of, you know, mitigating a bit the word hate, she said, how can one woman possibly fulfill all the expectations of chapter 31? I mean, some of you, you were checking off. Yeah, I do a list and a little bit of that, but did you do all those things? How can one woman possibly do it? And then, of course, in her sassy way, she says, why isn't there a similar chapter for men? Right? I feel disqualified. I heard that. Somebody from Canada wrote back to me because I had inquired with her and I respect her opinion in Scripture, she says this, I felt at times that it was difficult to live up to the expectations of these verses. I felt that I could not measure up, and thoughts of failure would come up. In today's world, women are working more, they're raising a family, and they're leading a Christian life. It's difficult to follow these verses and feel successful and not be burnt out. Now, according to traditional Jewish usage of this passage, it would be recited by the husband to the wife every Sabbath Eve. Can you imagine every week, every Friday night, date night begins with, honey, sit down, we're going to go over Proverbs 31 again. That's a true story. 
And think about it, isn't the book of Proverbs rather chauvinistic as well? What about those verses that pity the poor men who have nagging wives? I mean, even for us to say, you know, in Proverbs 32 it says, if you treat your wife like a thoroughbred, she won't be a nag. But even people don't like that one. <laughs> it also goes on, you know these ones, better to live on the corner of a roof than with a quarrelsome wife. Or a quarrelsome wife is like a constant dripping on a rainy day. Restraining her is like restraining the wind or grasping oil with the hand. That's in the Bible. Or this one, which kind of is the reason why we're snowbirds. Better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and ill-tempered wife. Well, that's in there too, honest. I'm not making that one up. That's in 2119 in case you want to fact check. So enough of that. All right. You get the picture and you may have felt the sting of some of those verses, right? They're kind of uncomfortable. It seems like it's un unfairly weighed against the women. So here's the deal. The book of Proverbs is an ancient document. It's an ancient document. It was written to a different culture, largely patriarchal. It was addressed, as you can see, to my son or my sons over and over again. You see that. And so it was often seen as a document that was to give a son wisdom to train him up in the way he should go so that he could be a leader of the land or could be a proper king. So you've got that kind of uh, royal wisdom that's going on there. Ancient culture. I got that. And I'm glad we don't live back then. How about you? So let's fast forward to 2018 right now. What is the value of this ancient collection of sayings? What could possibly be the value? Well, number one, first of all, it is still God's word. We have to deal with it, all right? We have to figure out what is God's word to us in our culture of 2018. And so we must listen very carefully to it. Second, I believe that most of the Proverbs are mirrors that we are to stand in front of and see ourselves if we look deeply enough, all right? I don't want to use any of the verses of Proverbs as a weapon to beat somebody else up to make them feel bad. God looks on the heart. God looks on the heart through each proverb. He reveals my heart to me. And so we must all, I hope this doesn't sound too harsh, we all have to look at the fool within us. All right? And at times when we manage to shine, let's also feel God's approval, smile of approval upon us too, that we're, we've made some wise choices here and there, haven't we? So Life Church, where everyone is welcome and nobody escapes moments of proverbial folly. Is that not right? And also, since every proverb is a mirror, here's, here's the deal. We are to, at times, interchange the genders, the pronouns. All right? So if it's, a, if it's wisdom for a, a man, does it not apply to the women as well? For example, in Proverbs, if you look carefully enough, is it only women who are quarrelsome? Absolutely not. In 26.21, if you're taking notes, you may want to do this, wives. Is charcoal to embers and as wood to a fire, so is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. Are only women hot-tempered or hot-headed? It says this, a hot-tempered man stirs up dissension. It says, do not make friends with a hot-tempered man. So what do we see? Men aren't exactly perfect either. Let me ask you this question. Stereotypically, which gender is portrayed as gossipy? Women, right? You got your salons, you got, you know, all that kind of stuff. Because they have so much free time, all they, they do is gossip, right? But guess what? Who is the gossip in the book of Proverbs? Twice, the same verse, we have it. It's repeated identically. It says, the words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to a man's inmost parts. To what? To a man's inmost parts. Men are absolutely gossips as well. So to answer the question, why don't men get a chapter? Well, guess what? Men get 30 plus chapters if we just look carefully enough. Who is predominantly the fool? Who is predominantly the glutton or the sluggard or the liar? Who is predominantly disrespectful to parents, causing grief to them? It is a foolish son. It is the man. It is the wicked ruler. It's the men who are often the targets of folly in the book of Proverbs. I don't know if that makes you feel any better, women. But back to my comment about interchanging the genders. Proverbs apply to all. So when it says, a foolish son brings grief to his parents, 
Is there anything wrong with us interchanging and saying a foolish daughter brings grief? Of course, we understand that idea of flipping the terms there. So, here's where we get on dangerous territory. What if chapter 31 wasn't about the ideal woman? What if this woman of chapter 31 isn't actually a woman? What if this wife of noble character that we're all to look for, to find, what if she is actually Lady Wisdom? She's the one referred to earlier in the book of Proverbs. You understand, some of you remember your school days, what the word personification is about, where you give human qualities, characteristics to, to uh, neutral things or concepts like wisdom. So turning wisdom into a person. And of course, women get chosen for wisdom. Aren't you glad for that? It says, wisdom calls aloud in the street. She raises her voice in the public squares. It goes on to say, does not wisdom, capital W, wisdom call out? Does not understanding raise her voice? So we see how Proverbs is personifying wisdom as a lady. It goes on to say, wisdom has built her house. And says, let all who are simple come in here. Now you contrast Lady Wisdom with Lady Folly, or Woman Folly, who's also a character in the book of Proverbs. So you got these two gals in there. And it says this, The woman Folly is loud. She doesn't use her inside voice. She is undisciplined and without knowledge. It goes on to say, Blessed is the man who finds wisdom. Blessed is the man who finds Lady Wisdom. Blessed is the man who finds a wife of noble character, Wisdom. For she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She's more precious than rubies. More precious than rubies. What do we see in chapter 31? Wife of noble character who can find she is worth far more than rubies. Okay, so we see that repetition there. Now I want to give you this one. Uh, in chapter 7, verse 4 of Proverbs, it says, to the, says this to all of us. Say to wisdom, you are my sister. All right, it's referring to wisdom as a, a family member. But here's the interesting thing, is that term that's usually translated sister is also used as a term of endearment by a husband to his wife. Say to wisdom, you are my sister. It's like, it's like calling, you know, in ancient Near East back in the day, to call your wife sister is a term like honey or dear, that kind of stuff, right? Somebody who's very precious and close to you. So we see this idea, say to wisdom, what? I want to be married to you. It goes on to say as well, esteem her, and she will exalt you, embrace her. And she will do what? She will honor you. What do we see happening in, the, in the chapter 31? The husband is where? He's sitting at the city gate where he takes a seat among the elders of the land. He's in a place of honor and respect because of wisdom in his life. Who can find such a wife? It's a rhetorical question. Many people, commentaries will joke and they say, well, she, she's not out there, she can't be found. But the answer is, anybody can find her. Whosoever will can come to Lady Wisdom. And so over and over again, Proverbs uses the word picture of wisdom as a woman to be sought after and embraced and loved. Now our society could use some of this basic wisdom as a foundation again. It seems that good old-fashioned common sense has been eroded. It's become rare. Through embracing God's wisdom is found in this book. Basic decency, things like truth and politeness, kindness, neighborliness, a healthy work ethic, and generosity, they can make a great comeback in our society. Now I want to give you a quick word here on how awkward some word pictures are. Women in here might struggle with the idea of of them being told you know, to find this noble wife, to be married to wisdom. But I want you to th think a little bit about how we men think about being part of the bride of Christ. Right? It's a little bit awkward for us, but we can, you know, if we think about it enough, we, we can understand it and go with it. All right. And if you really want to just switch the genders or make them a little bit more neutral, which is okay, is you can say a spouse of noble character who can find. By the way, there's a little bit of an aside. Have you ever wondered what the husband does in, in chapter 31 anyways? It's the woman who's doing all the hard work, all the grunt work, and all the husband does is what? 
All he has to do is he, he has to hobble over to the city gate where he takes his cushion uh, with all the other men to chew the fat and drink camel's milk. And uh, one Jewish commentary I, I looked into, he said this. He said, one gets the feeling that while this female paragon of virtue gets up early in the morning to do her work, her husband remains in bed snoring. And by the way, in the original Hebrew, the term couch potato is masculine. All right. So such an emphasis on the women doing all the work is really, it's got to be a red flag to us, isn't it? Like, the women is, woman is really expected to do all that work, the be merchant, selling land, all the rest of it, planting vineyards. Like, like, what is the husband doing anyways? So that's a red flag that maybe this isn't a literal woman, never was expected to be. But for me, what seals the deal that this wife is actually Lady Wisdom is the structure of the passage. How many verses are there? 22. Some of you know this. How many letters in the Hebrew alphabet? 22. Guess what? Each of the verses starts with the successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. In other words, it's poetry, and it's a very skillfully crafted bit of poetry. It's an acrostic. And so really, it's from A to Z, or those of you who are from Canada, A to Z. Sometimes an author would, would do that kind of an acrostic, careful poetry because it would be an aid to memorizing. So, you know, if you're trying to memorize it and you forget, okay, what's the fourth verse? Well, Aleph, Bed, Gimel, Da. Okay, it starts with that and then triggers your memory. Right? So it's easy to memorize that way. But it also, an acrostic with all 22 letters signifies completion or perfection. And so what we have here in chapter 31 is the perfect blueprint for a house or a life that is built on wisdom. Remember I read to you earlier, chapter 9, verse 1, wisdom has built her house. And so we have before us the ABCs of wisdom. And if we embrace her, if we embrace the blueprint of wisdom as laid out in Proverbs, if we embrace her, if we esteem her, life certainly goes a whole lot more smoothly, doesn't it? Wisdom brings us good, not harm, all the days of our lives. When we have full confidence in her, in this blueprint, we will truly lack nothing of value. We will have what really counts. We will have family. We will have harmony. We will have peace. We will have fulfillment. And so, if you, I've done the careful study. Each of the 22 verses represents a concept that is taught elsewhere in the whole book of Proverbs. So that makes sense, doesn't it? At the very end of the book, you have a, a summary, ABCs of wisdom that have been talked about in the previous 30 chapters. Now, I'm not going to take the time to spell them all out for you, but I'm going to give you a few, just a sampling. For example, I mentioned this already, chapter 10, or verse 10, it starts off, who can find her? I gave you the answer. Anybody who wants to can find her. Because she's out there in the city streets, in the city squares, and she's calling aloud, she's singing, actually, is uh, one of the Hebrew terms that's used there. She's singing for everybody to come. So she's not remote, she's not hiding, she's not a secret. She's right there inviting all of us. What is her value? More precious than rubies. I shared to you the, the other verse, chapter 3, verse 15, that talks about wisdom being more precious than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her. That's one of my favorite lines in the Hebrew of that particular text because it says, literally, if you were reading the Hebrew, it says, he trusts his heart to her. He trusts his heart to her. You know Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. What does it say? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. He trusts his heart to her. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understandings. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. You'll lack nothing of value. You don't have to fear for your life. All right. So she brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. It says in Proverbs numerous times, whoever listens to me, that is Lady Wisdom, whoever listens to me will go on their way in safety without fear of harm. In chapter 18.10, it says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. All right? When you fear the Lord, when you fear, respect his wisdom, trust his wisdom, you are safe from so much that's happening out there that could get you into trouble. I love that passage. In verses 13 through 19, as we see, you know, she's like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She selects wool and flax, so she's making clothes. Uh, she gets up while it's still dark. She stays up. Her lamp does not go out at night. All that kind of stuff. It speaks just basically about anybody who's industrious, they, they work hard, they work wisely. 
It embraces creativity. By definition, wisdom is skill of any sort. And so you all represent all different types of wisdom here. Skills with your hands, craftsmanship, art, know-how, music, whatever it might be. And the key here, God wants us to understand no one person is supposed to do it all. God has given different gifts so that we can then be a unity. And so in a sense, Proverbs 31 is like that. Nobody's supposed to check off and be all those things because you wouldn't get any sleep, correct? Um, And I'm supposed to tell you this from Shannon as well. She says, hey, tell them that the Proverbs 31 woman, she gets up early and gets her food from afar, but tell them that the Proverbs 32 woman wakes up late and goes through the drive-thru. All right, Proverbs, uh, verse 20 is the middle verse, all right? So you've got uh, 10 through 31, and basically, verse 20 is the middle verse. What do we expect for something that's smack dab in the middle? It might be important. And guess what the important verse is, if that's true? Smack dab in the middle of the ABCs of wisdom comes God's heart for mankind. Generosity and justice. She opens her arms to the poor, extends her hands to the needy. That's in the center of this passage on wisdom. And so, generosity and justice is key to our society. A wise person will open his arms to help the needy. A wise person will be a good Samaritan. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Chapter 11, verse 25 says, A generous man will himself be blessed, for he shares his, his food with the poor. And so there, there's... Numerous other passages on that, and there are a few that describe the stingy man as well, because women are not stingy. Then verses 21 to 24, and move along really quickly here. A wise person takes care of things on the home front and on the work front. Providing isn't just about food on the table and clothes on the back and a roof over the head, although that's very important. But on the home front, a wise person provides a secure fortress for their children. It says in chapter 14, 26, he who fears the Lord has a secure fortress or secure home and for his children it will be a refuge. And I look at our society and I'm so grateful for my home that I was raised in. I trust that our home for our kids was a refuge. That when they get battered and beat up at times by school or whatever it is out there in the world, that they know they can come to the safe place called home with mom and dad, with family. That's a wise home. Now let's skip to the conclusion. Of verses 28 to 31. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Her children. We can be a bit confused. Can I be a child of wisdom and also be the husband or the spouse of wisdom as well? Well, perhaps all it speaks to is just different stages of growth. That is, as children, you start to learn wisdom, and then as you become more mature, you fully embrace her or him as your spouse. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 7. He said, Wisdom is proved right by all her children. Wisdom is proved right by all her children. It will all come out in the wash. I call Proverbs the book of consequences. There are sad, costly, sometimes tragic consequences for making foolish choices, for living a life of folly. But there are also some awesome consequences for us all. As we make the right choices, we avoid certain traps, we get rewards for other, other Proverbs that we live by. I consulted several Jewish commentaries on this chapter. And each one took this idea of the Proverbs 31 woman one step further than I did. Because I said, chapter 31 is about lady wisdom. But they take it one step further and they say, chapter 31 is about the entire Torah, the entire scripture. And it's really interesting to read some of their takes on these different verses as they apply it to that. So I want to conclude with three challenges. All right? Number one, I'm going to give you, this is homework, and I'm not here, so I don't have to worry about fallout. I'm going to give you two verses that I'm going to invite you to memorize so they can inspire you to get your face in this book of Proverbs. And it's chapter 3, verses 13 and verse 18. So chapter 3, 13 and 18. It says this, Blessed is the man or person who finds wisdom. She is a tree of life to those who embrace her. Those who lay hold of her will be blessed. That's pretty simple. She's a tree of life. And therefore, I'm encouraging all of us to be tree huggers. All right? 
Embrace her, the tree of life. All right, so two little verses to memorize, but it's getting harder now. Second challenge. If you aren't already doing this, if you've never done it before, let me invite you to do this. As an attempt to embrace wisdom, try reading one chapter of Proverbs a day. Now, I'm sure many of you have done that, and you know that Proverbs has 31 chapters. A chapter a day keeps folly's consequences away. So conveniently, 31 chapters, one for each day of the month, although poor chapter 31, the wife of noble character, that one doesn't get read very often. Several times through the year, it gets missed. But as you read through, just embrace the messages of the various Proverbs. You don't have to get every verse. Think of each chapter of Proverbs as a multivitamin. That maybe that day you don't need that little bit of vitamin B or that vitamin C, whatever it is, but there's that other vitamin there that you need. So just watch for that and enjoy it. And so remember, embrace the messages of the various Proverbs and look in the mirror, try to see yourself. Don't use the Proverbs to reflect on other people. Say, that person is such a glutton. That person is such a truth stretcher. See yourself. She or he who walks with the wise grows wise, so it wouldn't hurt to walk with the wise sayings of Scripture. Now here's the last challenge, and it comes with a reward of huge proportions. And I wish I had it up there on the overhead. If you want to come to the next service, I'll have the full PowerPoint working. But, but I have these Get Your Face in the Book stickers. All right, aren't they a lovely item? And uh, so it's promoting a certain ministry. But here, here's, uh, here's your challenge. For the first, I have five for each service. So the first five people who come up to me and tell me that they're going to do this challenge, you'll get one of these stickers and you can you know, use it wisely. But here it is. Try writing out the book of Proverbs. Buy a cheap notebook. The kind I use, 99 cents if you get them on sale. That's pretty good, huh? That's not bad. So it's a good deal. Get a cheap notebook and just start with just writing five verses out a day. Just how long can that possibly take you? All right, maybe longer for some. That's okay. Or maybe you want to do 10 verses. Maybe you'll start getting addicted to it. And you might even try, you know, 15 verses. But be prepared. If it takes you a month or two months to write out the book of Proverbs, who cares how long it takes? It's the time you spend in the scripture that's valuable. And so if you do that, if you were to write out the book of Proverbs, not only do you get this amazing sticker, but I promise you this, that you will learn from the Bible at a, lesson, at a level that will knock your socks off, I guarantee you. You'll be surprised at how little time it takes you each day to write out those verses. And you will realize what a treasure you actually have. And so let me close with this line. Wisdom is beautiful. Wisdom is beautiful. Embrace her and she will reward you. Amen.